Semantic Kernel gives us all sorts of awesome powers that we can leverage AI for in our C-sharp applications. And in this video, I wanted to walk you through some of the basics of working with plugins in Semantic Kernel. Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. If you haven't watched the previous video, you can check it out right up here, which is going to walk you through how to get the very basics of Semantic Kernel set up in a C-sharp project. But if you're already familiar with how that works, then this is going to be a great next step for getting some simple plugins to work with Semantic Kernel. If that sounds interesting, just a reminder to subscribe to the channel and check out that pinned comment for my courses on Dome Train. Now let's jump over to Visual Studio and talk about Semantic Kernel plugins. On my screen, I have a project that is from the previous video, which walks us through how to get set up with Semantic Kernel, but I figured it would be a good opportunity to talk about what plugins are with respect to Semantic Kernel. In the previous video and lots of other examples that we've all been seeing online and what we're familiar with when we're talking with things like ChatGPT or other LLMs is we have this idea of a conversation, right? We're able to send messages to the LLM, it interprets those messages, and then gives us a result back based on what we sent it. Now, as time has gone on, we've seen more and more fancy features get built into these conversational AI tools. With something like Semantic Kernel, we're able to start integrating different types of code plugins into the kernel. And that way, when we're using things like chat completions, the AI is able to start interacting with those plugins. As we're going to step through this, I'll briefly walk through the setup for Semantic Kernel, and then we're going to see how we can start leveraging the plugin. So again, if you haven't watched the previous video, you're going to need to be able able to have your endpoints set up. And this is currently leveraging Azure OpenAI, which you can see right down here where we add Azure OpenAI chat completion. If you're using something else with a semantic kernel, there's other connectors for this. You can go ahead and get that set up, but that's a prerequisite before we move on. But this is going to be the kernel setup, right? So we're able to use the builder pattern. We build the kernel. And then what we want to do is ask the kernel for the chat completion service. And once we have that on line 28, we we can start working with it. But there's a little bit more that we have to do because if we just go on from here, we can do like in the previous video where we just start chatting with the AI and it's able to do the chat completions, which is still really impressive. It still blows my mind that we can do this, but it's not able to interact with anything. And that's where plugins are going to come into play. Now we are going to be borrowing the Lights plugin example from Microsoft in their documentation. So you can see on line 30, what I'm now doing is saying kernel plugins add from type, and then I'm adding the Lights plugin and calling it Lights. That's cool, but what the heck is the Lights plugin? Well, this is going to be the plugin in this tutorial that we're going to see how that looks. And you should be able to take the concepts you see in this tutorial and make something completely different. If you stay to the end of this video, I will have another one where we're able to see how we can actually interact with YouTube and Semantic Kernel all at once. To start things off, I'm going to jump down to this plugin definition, which is at the bottom of the file here. So I am going to jump one moment and we can see that we have this Lights plugin. Again, this one is going to be very contrived. It is borrowed from the Microsoft example, but this Lights plugin has a few things going on. So to start things off, this is going to have some state. And because this is really just a contrived example, this state is just stored in memory. But in theory, you could have this state persisted in a database written to a file. You could be asking for this information from a service, which is what we'll be seeing when we do the YouTube example after. But for now, this is just going to be state that is stored in memory, quite literally in this list right here called lights. This example has three different light models in here. It has a table lamp, a porch light and a chandelier. And then we can see that they have some default state associated with them and an ID. This is just an example. If you want to play around with this code, you could do the exact same thing. You could add new lights. You could remove these ones, rename them, whatever you want to do. This is just to have something to work with. But the really interesting part is that we have these methods down here and they're annotated with lots of extra information. If we look at something like get lights async, it's incredibly simple, right? It's just returning this lights collection. This one that came from Microsoft was marked as async already with a task. I guess the reality of this one is that it doesn't need to be asynchronous based on what we're doing here, but I'm just keeping that signature basically the same. And we'll see the same thing down here with this change state async. The code itself isn't actually doing anything that requires being asynchronous, but not really the point. The point of this one is that we have all of this extra information up here. And why might we want extra information when we're thinking about working with code and an LLM together. 
Well, we're all familiar with the fact that LLMs really like verbose information to work with, right? If you're experienced with providing prompts to LLMs, if you're very short and succinct and not providing a lot of detail, you're going to get a variation of results. And a lot of the time it might not be something that you're happy with and you'll have to say, hmm, oh crap, how do I give it more information to do what I need? And that's the whole idea with the annotations that we have here. So you can see that we have this description annotation. So this is just called an attribute in C Sharp. So description attribute, we can even put it on the return and we should be able to put it on the parameters and we don't have them down here, but we can go ahead and add them onto the method parameters as well. So I can add a description on both of these and I could say, this is the identifier, the light. And then I can say on this one, true if the light is on, false if the light is off. And that way we have these also annotated. And the whole idea here is that we're providing extra information, extra verbosity to the LLM so that when it's trying to figure out how to work with our plugins, it can see what it has available to it and it understands how to interact with it. Again, if we just had the variable names like ID, ID of what, right? Change state async and we give it an ID. The idea of what though? Right. We probably can infer as humans, as developers, based on the fact that we're looking at this code that's a lights plugin, we could probably say, well, it's going to be the ID of the light. But the LLM, the more context you give it, the more accurate it's able to operate. So we want to be able to provide all of this extra information. So we can do that on the method itself. We can do that on the return value. So this says the updated state of the light will return null if the light does not exist, right? So giving it extra information to understand how to interpret that result as well. And then uh, like we just did, we have it on the uh, method parameters as well. So lots of extra information so the LLM can work with it. This is just a quick interruption from this video sponsor, which is Pact Publishing. Now, Pact has sent me over this book from Mark J. Price, which is C Sharp 13 and .NET 9 Modern Cross-Platform Development Fundamentals. And I have the previous edition of this book sitting on my bookshelf as well. And now I have this one, which is super exciting because this book is packed with tons of awesome examples that guide you through the different functionalities of the language. Now, I think that this is an awesome reference guide. I think that you'll have tons of things that you can walk through from the very beginning to learn about C Sharp. But one of the best parts about this is that it's not just limited to looking at the language. You'll get to see things like ASP.NET Core, Entity Framework, as well as Blazor, all in action with practical examples in the book. I personally cannot recommend Mark J. Price's books enough. Like I said, he's got tons of awesome examples and he has other books as well from Pact that I do highly recommend you check out. So if you're interested in this, you can check out the link in the description and I'll have a link up here as well that you can check out. Thanks, and now back to the video. We also give it kernel function to note that these are methods that the kernel, semantic kernel, can actually leverage with the LLM and we give them names as well. So this name here, get lights, does not have to be the exact same here. And this is sort of what came out of the box from the example from Microsoft. So again, a quick look at the body of this, nothing too interesting. It's going to go find the light by its ID if it exists. And if it does exist, it's going to set the is on property to be whatever the LLM passes in and then from there we're going to return that light that's an example of what a plugin looks like i should also point out that this does not have to inherit from anything it's not like we had to go have um, some i plugin interface to implement or inherit from some abstract class and have to override things we literally just have this class, so no other dependency here, and then we add on these methods that are marked as public, and then we annotate them with the kernel function and then extra information with these attributes. Pretty simple, pretty cool that all we're doing is taking some code that might be very simple and then annotating it so that the LLM can understand what to do with it. Scrolling back up when we're working with the kernel, we go ahead and add the plugin, lights plugin called lights right onto the collection of plugins. Again, very simple, but what we want to do from there, and I touched on this in the previous video, we have these uh, open AI prompt execution settings that we can configure. So this is set to be auto, but if I go ahead and I put my cursor over this right here, we get this enormous tooltip. So I'm gonna read through some of it because there's some different options that you can play around with, right? So to disable function calling, which is not what we want to do in this video, but to disable it and have the model only generate a user-facing message, set the property to null, which is the default. 
So by default, when you're using semantic kernel with these chat completions, this is not going to be calling any functions. So if we wanted to do anything else to allow the model to decide whether to call a function, and if so, which ones to call, set the property to an instance returned by this method here. So this is going to be auto. That's what we're using. This next one says to force the model to always call one or more functions, set the property to an instance returned by the function, choice behavior required. So we're not using that. We are going to be using auto. And then it says to instruct the model to not call any functions and only generate a user facing message, set the property to an instance returned by function choice behavior none. So this is what you can configure on here. Like I said, we are going to be using auto so it can figure out if it does need to call functions. Depending on how you want to use semantic kernel, you might say, based on how I'm configuring this, it always needs to call something. Great, maybe you want to change what's going on here. But for us, because it's still going to be set up as a simple conversation, what we are able to do is just leave it set to auto. For this next part here, this is the loop that we had in the previous video. So again, simple loop to go ask for user input, send it to the LLM, and then get that response back. And I figured when I was going to put this video together, I was thinking, oh, we'll just clean it up and we'll make it just call the plugin. We'll have that go. But instead, I figured it might be cool if we could just have a conversation with it like normal. And then we can ask it to do something with the lights. I wanted to prove to you, though, that it is actually calling the functions. That's why I wanted to sort of strip out the conversation part of this and just make it sort of do the conversation behind the scenes and we could go ask for the information off of the plugin. I think we'll still do that, but we can go put a breakpoint in and we can see that we're not calling that code inside of the lights plugin. The LLM is, and that's pretty cool too. So let's go ahead and run this code and we're going to go ask the AI to turn off the chandelier because if we go have a look, we can see that the chandelier starts as on. So let's go ahead and try this and see what happens. So write your message to the AI bot. I would like you to turn off the chandelier. The chandelier has been turned off. Okay. Now, did we actually need a plugin to go do this, right? Is this just the AI making stuff up and we're just believing it? I don't know. So let's go see if we can ask it a different question. And then we're going to start dropping in some breakpoints to see what's actually happening behind the scenes. Well, instead of going to ask it if the chandelier is off now, because I think even without a plugin, it might figure out I just turned it off. It's probably off. Let's go ask it what the ID of another light is, because we haven't told it that. Now, I don't remember what they are, so let me jump back to Visual Studio. Let's go ask it what the ID of the porch light is. It says the ID of the porch light is 2. Interesting. I haven't even told it that, so how did it get that information? Lucky guess, or is it using the semantic kernel plugin? Let's go see how many lights there are. There are three lights in total. Okay, interesting. What are the names of lights? Table lamp, porch light, and chandelier. Okay, kind of spooky that it would know that without a plug-in, right? So let's go see if I put my cursor down in here, if we can hit a breakpoint. So we should know that the chandelier was on and now it's off. I'm going to go ask it to turn the porch light on. And we hit our breakpoint. So the LLM was able to call this. It knows that the ID of the porch light is 2, right? I didn't tell it that at any point. It knows that from the plugin information. And then is on is set to true because I told it turn on the porch light. So if I step through this, it will find it and it will go return it. And that means when I press F5, it says the porch light has been turned on and we got to see that it was actually calling the code in the plugin.
Now, I did say that I also wanted to show you how we can go confirm this without putting a breakpoint in place. So I just wanted to take a quick moment to show you how you can go invoke the plugin functions yourself. And that way, if you wanted to go play around with this and you don't necessarily want to have a console input and typing messages in, you can go ahead and see what the state is. Again, you might be implementing plugins in a completely different way. Maybe you see this information being written to and read from a database. But if you're dealing with it like I am in this case, let's go call that function directly. So what I'm going to do is run this again, but I've added this code here from line 60 to 63. What I'm going to do is ask the kernel for its plugins, and I'm going to say get the function from the lights plugin called get lights. This is the name of the function, not the name of the method itself, but the name of the kernel function that we added in the attribute, right? So if I scroll down, we can see kernel function here, get lights. I'm using that same name. And lights is not based on this here, but when we added that plugin, to the builder up top here, or directly onto the plugins rather, we gave it that lights name. So we're saying from that lights plugin, use this kernel function, and then we will invoke it and add kernel as the parameter into this method call. So let's go ahead and run this. We'll have to have a conversation very briefly. And then when I'm done and I press enter with an empty message, we should hit that breakpoint. So please turn off the chandelier. We hit our breakpoint, excellent. Now when I press enter, it should end the chat loop and we should be able to have called this method get lights. When I put my cursor over this, it's a little bit hard to see because it's small, but we can see that we have all of this stuff here, right? This is not just the result. This is other information. It's not just the return value, but if we go look, but if I go ahead and I go to the non-public members that we see here, we can see that we have a count of three inside of the value property, right? So if I go expand this, we can see that we have our three light models. We have our table lamp. Is it on? No, it's off by default though. So nothing too surprising. If we go to number one, we can see the porch light is on is set to false. Again, that is the default, not very interesting. But if we go to the last one, the chandelier, by default, it is on. So what is it now? It is now set to false. If you look at the very bottom of my Visual Studio code part, it says on line 72, by default, chandelier is on is set to true. We ask the LLM to turn it off. And now when we invoke this function ourselves calling get lights, we can also read back that data. So writing that out to the console is actually not gonna print out something very pretty. It's not very helpful. I just wanted to have a breakpoint at the end of the file here so that we could hit it in the debugger. Now we can see that we can call this directly if we need to. And that way it's the same type of thing that the LLM is going to be doing behind the scenes. A quick recap to set things up. You need to make sure you have all of your stuff set up in your Azure portal if you're using Azure. Azure. That's what we're doing in this example on line 22 here. From there, we need to make sure that we are adding plugins of interest onto the plugins collection on the kernel. We also need to make sure that we're allowing functions to be called. So I'm using auto in this case to allow it to automatically determine if it needs to call a function. And then what we were able to do is go look at the plugin implementation and we needed to make sure that we were annotating things. So we have a kernel function attribute. We also have a description that we can add on to the methods, the return types and the parameters. And that way we're giving lots of extra context to the LLM. Then we saw that in action. And finally, we got to see that we can also invoke those methods ourselves. So if you thought this was cool and you want to see more examples of working with plugins, you can check out this video next to see how we can start interacting with something like YouTube. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.